Hi there, everybody. We're here to talk um, a little bit about data visualization. Um, this is an important topic right now because we are at the forefront of a data revolution and it's uh, more important now than ever to really be able to extract information, meaningful information from raw data. Um, I want to start by saying that design isn't necessarily a science, but that doesn't mean it's completely subjective either. The principles that we're going to be talking about are definitely grounded in disciplines of, you know, not only statistics, um, and all the natural sciences, but biology, physics, psychology, and physiology. This is a lot about how we perceive graphics uh, and how we can use that to control and leverage um, what humans naturally do to make our graphics uh, more powerful. So we're going to talk about data visualization, why it matters, and then uh, get into some best practices. We have all seen this kind of a presentation before, right, where we use really flashy colors and exaggerate fonts to drive our points home. I and mean, if you throw in some really overutilized clip art and some zippy animations, you've got yourself um, a, a pretty powerful disaster. Um, but these are all uh, critical techniques that we can use in in data visualization to create strong graphics. The idea of movement, um, using images, color, contrast, and focusing on anomalies. I'm going to talk about all these things in just a minute. Uh, this is an example of a very uh, ineffective visualization. Obviously, this is supposed to be your classic red-blue political map, um, but the map author didn't consider moving to grayscale. This was actually published in the Wall Street Journal back in 2012. It's a little bit shocking. Okay, at its basic definition, what is data visualization? It is data in picture form. And for a brief example, um, here's a table comparing domestic and international sales by month. And tables are very handy. And they're effective at being able to pinpoint um, exactly if you want to know what the domestic sales were in May, for example, of 2009. You can get an exact number very easily. But if we draw the same data in picture form, the comparisons between domestic and international sales jump right out at us. We could sit and look at these numbers, but if we were taking the raw numbers in, we're going to be creating visual images in our head anyway, so drawing them like this just makes it so easy. We're also able to pull out quarterly patterns in the domestic trend, see trends over time, and pick out anomalies that are certainly visible in the data, but become so readily apparent when we see it um, in picture form. So, um, the, what are the elements of a good graphic? Um, Dr. Emily Birchfield is going to talk a little bit about making sure that you have a clear purpose. Um, sometimes it might be that you are um, trying to extract information or look for patterns. You're doing some kind of um, evaluation. Uh, or maybe you've already found some results and you're just trying to communicate them. So having a clear focus for your graphic, but also making sure that you're picking the appropriate output for your data type. And that's what Emily's going to talk about. Uh, I just want to bring it to your attention that we're talking about not just graphics. We're not talking about just charts or plots or graphs. We're also talking about maps, formal maps, um, scientific posters, or PowerPoint presentations. So this can apply to just about any visual uh, output that you're creating. Um, okay, so the things I'm going to talk about um, after fit for purpose and fit for data are um, concepts of focus and clarity in your graphics, um, the concept of visual hierarchy, applying intuitive color, and decluttering your graphs, just to simplify. All right, we know that this cliche is true because it wouldn't be a cliche otherwise. The question is, why is a picture worth a thousand words? Um, this gets to why we care about data visualization. Why does it, because it does take a lot of time. Why do we want to spend the time to create powerful graphics? Well, it turns out that humans are hardwired to make easy sense of shapes and colors and visual um, graphics like that. And um, at much more so than just trying to synthesize raw numbers or text. Um, data visualizations help us see things that aren't easily seen in the raw numbers or statistics. Um, and like I said, we're kind of at the forefront of a data revolution, so it's more important now than ever. And it's actually sometimes vital. This is a sad example. Um, one of the graphs that was produced, one of hundreds that was produced as a part of a, a report, the Rogers Commission, um, to, to study what happened after the Challenger blew up in 1986. This is a graph um, that was produced to try and understand what was happening with the O-rings at different temperatures on the on solid rocket motors, the SRMs. 
And you know, I challenge you to look at this and see if you can discern any kind of pattern at all. I mean, this, this is already a visualization, right? It's already a graphic. Um, we, have the, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know now that it was the temperature that was causing the O-rings uh, to not be able to flex and didn't cause good seals, and um, that's where the damage came in. So with hindsight, we're able to create a chart that's much more focused and is built strictly to demonstrate the relationship between O-ring damage and temperature at the time of launch. So each of the black points is a launch or is a, you know, a study of O-rings and the amount of um, O-ring damage per launch. And so what we see here in the range of 65 degrees to 82 degrees Fahrenheit is um, a lot of evidence of no O-ring damage at all, and a couple. Then this guy is one year prior. This was the space shuttle Discovery that did successfully launch and land one year prior to uh, the Challenger. It was the lowest temperature launch on, you know, to that date and also had the highest amount of damage. But without this one point, we don't really have a trend here at all. But with that point, it's kind of this glaringly obvious trend. This is the temperature that the Challenger took off at. So, you know, it's one of those things that in hindsight, the pattern should have been visible, but we didn't have, we just didn't have that knowledge going into it. Anyway, it's, it's kind of an interesting but sad example. All right, so I'm going to pass it over to Emily, and she's going to talk about how to choose the right graph, and then we'll come back and talk about how to make it look good. So in this little talk, I'm going to give you an overview of some different types of data you might encounter and how you can, can and should deal with that data in terms of reducing it to some meaningful information and, and visualizing it. The first thing uh, that's useful just to kind of pause and think about is that really data is just about everything and is just about everywhere. Um, going from sort of the real world to data involves a process of abstraction or reduction. And here I just put up a little blurb of some programmers in the UK who have turned um, repeated data algorithms into music. Um, and so again, even you can think of music as a form of data. And so the art of data science and data visualization is figuring out the most appropriate way to translate different types of data into information that, that transmit the, the message uh, that you're interested in and, and that is honest. So if you think about any data set um, that you're working with, like think of a typical Excel spreadsheet. You've normally got a whole bunch of numbers in a spreadsheet organized in columns. And so say you're interested in classifying Lego characters and you can think about dividing different attributes of these Lego characters up. For example, you might have a uh, color of pants. Uh, you might have military adornment, yes or no. So that would be sort of a binary categorical variable. Is there military adornment? Yes. Is there not? No. Um, you could have a category describing um, heads of the Lego men. So is skull, it could be a binary variable, one for yes, zero for no. Or you could have something that's categorical that describes the color of the Lego man's head, white for uh, the skeleton head, and you've got kind of this peachy pink color for the other Lego guys, and then the classic Lego yellow. So you could think for each of these different attributes, sort of the pants, top, and head of Lego Lego men, you can describe them in multiple dimensions. You could even think of uh, instances where you could uh, measure something that's more of a continuous numeric variable, like the width of these um, Lego top portions. You can see like the third one from the front has some very intense uh, military adornment, and so it's probably a little bit wider than some of the other uh, Lego tops. So I think you get the idea here. There are a lot of different ways you can break up um, real world things like these Lego men into pieces and quantify them. Now we're going to be working with a data set that has uh, several attributes, not as interesting unfortunately as Lego men, but still pretty interesting. We're looking at um, countries of the world, um, Afghanistan, Albania, etc that are grouped in by continent, so the continent in which they are found. There are specific years um, 
for which data is observed in each country. So for example, Afghanistan will have an observation in 1952, 57, and every five years after 1957, all the way until 2007. There's the um, average life expectancy or the life expectancy in that year in that country. Same for population in that year in that country, as well as GDP per capita and average or sort of total GDP for the country. So these are really big numbers. So looking at the data like this, it's kind of dull, a little bit boring, and very hard to interpret. But if you think about what it actually means, you know, these are very rough abstractions and estimations of quality of life in different places. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at data, it's important to think about this, the meaning behind the data. What is the data actually trying to indicate and trying to capture? And in this case, we're talking about some fairly important things, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. Those things together say a lot about how well people live their lives. So let's talk about one of the first ways you can pull some information out of data. And this is um, figuring out the central tendency of the data and also looking at the spread of the data. So what does that mean? You guys have probably heard of mean, median, and mode. This is basically where you take a vector of data, say estimates of life expectancy in one country, and you extract what is essentially the average um, life expectancy, that's the mean, the mode or the most frequently occurring value of life expectancy, and the median, which is if you sorted life expectancy from lowest to highest, what value falls straight in the middle. And you can visualize these using a histogram. Um, this is something I often do when I just want to look at what might we'll see quickly what does life expectancy look like across all countries. Again, the mean is just one very small number here shown with that red vertical line and up in the upper left, the actual value is like pretty low actually, almost 60 years is the mean life expectancy. You see the median is a little bit higher, which kind of makes sense because of the right skew to the distribution and the mode is also a little bit higher. But looking at the distribution of the data tells a much more interesting story than just the mean, median, or mode. Here the distribution shows that apparently there are some countries with uh, an average life expectancy over the last 50 years of less than 30 years old. And so anytime you have data, you really should, yes, extract mean, median, and mode, but also look at the histogram of the data. Now, a histogram is not neutral either. On the left, I've shown a histogram with a bin size of five, of five units. So this, the bars essentially count the number of instances in every five unit increment in life expectancy. On the right, I've increased the resolution of the bins so that um, you're binning for every sort of, it looks like half, half a year increase in life expectancy. And so you see a much finer picture that comes out. You can sort of see this interesting bimodal uh, shape of life expectancy, and you can see a couple of really surprising outlier observations. So let's say you want to look at average life expectancy over the time in this data set, so like 1950 to 2007 across countries. And you might compute the average life expectancy across this time period in different countries and make a bar plot like I've done and say, oh wow, look, looks like life expectancy in Belgium is higher than in Chile. Remember, this is average life expectancy through time. Do not do this. When you are reducing data from a big vector of, in this case, observations of life expectancy over the last 50 years, and you want to say something about the average life expectancy through time, remember, computing the mean is simply reducing this big vector of numbers to a single value. Welcome to my favorite plot in the whole world, the box and whisker plot. So what this plot does is, yes, it shows the means, and, or the median rather, which is the vertical dark bar in the middle of the box and whisker plots. The box shows the middle 50% of the data, and that whisker is what it's called, or the line, shows 95% of the data. And so this gives you a sense not only of the mean, but how much the data varies. So remember, we're looking at multiple observations and extracting the mean. These box and whisker plots give us a much better sense of how much variation there's been from 1950 to 2007 in the life expectancy in these countries. Notice that Chile and China have pretty big variation. There have been significant changes that have happened in those countries. Um, and notice also that it becomes much more difficult to say, for example, that average life expectancy is higher in Belgium than in Chile. So yay, this is what you should do. 
Now, if you just want to count the number of countries, so summarize count data, a bar plot's totally fine. That's what they're kind of made for. You're comparing counts of things across values. So in this case, I've just counted the number of countries across continents, and rather surprisingly, Africa has a whole lot of countries in it. So yay, this is good. Another thing I want to quickly talk about is how you uh, process your the data that you're working with. So in this case, I'm plotting um, total GDP by across three countries. Obviously, I'm really into Belgium, and here's the United States again. And it looks like, wow, the United States is significantly wealthier than pretty much anywhere else. Now, this is total GDP. This is the sum of GDP, the gross domestic product in a whole country. And it does not take into account how many people are in that country. Belgium is an itty-bitty tiny country. Sri Lanka is pretty small, too. The United States is massive. And so if you compute, so don't do this. If you compute GDP per capita, which standardizes the GDP by the total number of folks living in the country, a very different story emerges. And so this is a reminder to think about how you transform the data you're representing. Do you want to compute z-scores and standardize your data so you can compare across different metrics? Do you need to standardize by something like population so that what you're representing is a little more honest? So be sure to think about this. And this is very good. So now let's move on to talking about um, relationships. And now I'm not talking about like, actual relationships. I'm just going to talk about relationships between vectors of data, in this case, correlation. And so you, know, you may have, for example, at some point computed the correlation between two variables and found a fairly high number. You know, as you approach one, you reach near perfect correlation, where things move in perfect unison. And you may have said, woohoo! This is great. There's a strong correlation between GDP per capita and life expectancy. If we want to boost life expectancy, let's just boost GDP per capita. However, if you actually look at the data using a visualization, in this case, I've used a scatter plot where the x-axis is GDP per capita and the y-axis is life expectancy, a very different story starts to emerge. What correlation does is it fits a linear trend to your data. I don't like this linear trend. Because it says you have this very strong correlation between these two variables, when in fact, if you actually look at the data, you notice something else is going on. If you were able to fit a nonlinear trend to the data, you might see that at some point GDP per capita no longer has positive impacts on life expectancy. However, this could also be due to the fact that there's really only a few countries out there um, where with very high GDP and low life expectancy. And so we can think of these points perhaps as outliers who are statistically different from the rest of the distribution of the data and actually have a very strong impact on correlation. So Consider nonlinearity when you're thinking about correlation. If you see a strong correlation between two variables, look at the scatter plot of these variables and see if there's a little more going on than you might expect. The last thing I'll say is that correlation is not causation. Let me repeat that. Correlation is not causation. Correlation is not causation. Correlation is not causation. Correlation is not causation. OK, I think you got it. The point here is that just because two variables move together, across time, across values, it does not mean that they are, are, are causally related. In this case, the age of Miss America merely correlates with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. It does not cause <laughs> this outcome. Here's another example. And yet another example. I recommend checking out uh, this website just for lots of funny examples of data that happens to move together. So I hope this was a useful overview of some of the ways you can extract and visualize your data. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, so let's get into uh, setting up powerful graphics. What are the elements of a good graphic? Emily just talked about being fit for purpose and uh, making sure you're using appropriate outputs for your data. And now we're gonna talk about clarity, hierarchy, color, and decluttering. Uh, first, it might be a little helpful to talk about how your eye, how humans perceive graphics and just visuals in general. Um, when you see an image like this, you might think that you're kind of taking it in all at once. It's very clear immediately that this is a forest, there's some kind of wooden walkway, we've got blue skies in the background. But what your brain is actually doing to take this information is it's, it's consuming tiny little snapshots, rapid fire snapshots. And it's really important to know that your brain isn't doing this randomly. And we can use this to our advantage to um, use 
background foreground, higher contrast, attention grabbing elements to sequen like sequentially organize information on a page to force your audience to take it in in a certain order. Uh, it turns out that your eye does expect balance and alignment. And so we can use um, different sizes, different orientations, um, positions that are slightly out of alignment, different line weights to draw um, the viewer's eye. And this works at improving legibility on the page. It gives your audience a place that they know they're supposed to start and helps create a sequence that they're supposed to take the information in at. Um, the idea of visual contrast is to, to play with that and really leverage uh, contrast to bring attention to the features that matter the most. If you're trying to just show um, everything being equally important, then treat it like this. But if you're trying to draw your audience's eye to a trend line or to one particular feature over another, you can use tricks like decreasing intensity of color, grouping like features and applying similar colors to them, or desaturating to blend colors together and let other things pop just because of their color. You want to make sure that the most important objects are placed on the page with the greatest contrast. And it can be contrast of color or just intensity. Um, and again, this leverages the human's natural ability to see patterns, notice differences, and fixate on anomalies. Uh, the concept of visual hierarchy is pretty straightforward. Um, the idea is if you treat everything the same, it's very difficult to start anywhere and you're sending no message about what your, like, what your core concept is for the page. So you want to have some overall focus, a central theme that you're trying to communicate, and then make sure that that's the first focus of attention. And um, I'm going to talk about some tricks to doing that in a second. Um, but the key is that you have something on the page or graph uh, or map or PowerPoint slide that is the most visually prominent and important thing. And then you're going to visually rank all the supporting elements according to their importance and how well they support the central theme. And we can do this with graphic elements but also with text. Just by differentiating text size or weight using boldness, it helps your audience understand what order to read things in and how important they are to the central theme. Uh, so just to drive that home, this is a graphic that's just um, kind of employing five basic tricks. Number one, make the most important things the biggest thing on the page. Uh, we've got an idea of real estate. The position on the page is uh, supported by the hierarchy. So in our culture, we tend to read top to bottom, left to right. And so you want to place your most important elements at the top or on the left. And so you can see here that we're using both color and contrast and size and page placement to let our audience know that this is the most important thing. And then just by reducing contrast as we move from left to right, we're also reinforcing that this is the most important element, much more important than this guy. We're employing size, contrast, color. Um, and then the idea of relative complexity and white space are somewhat related in that you want to have um, locations on the page or things that are more detailed, um, have um, more density and more complexity surrounded by less busy, less dense or aesthetically uh, stimulating things surrounding it and that cushion also helps reinforce the concept that this is the most important thing on the page. So five basic tricks. Um, the idea of visual balance is related to hierarchy but it's, it has to do more with how you're actually laying out the page and balancing the page and you can think about it as kind of using heavy color and larger sizes offset by areas that are um, more dense, a little bit more complex, more, um, have more variety in them, um, but use that as an offset so that your eye is kind of forced to move back and forth and it wants to pop around on the page, doesn't just get stuck somewhere. And putting those two concepts into practice, um, we can think about hierarchy and balance together. And so this is a fairly weak example that I tried to create. Um, theoretically, it's um, a formal map about the United Kingdom. So this would technically be the locator map, but here are the things that are going wrong with this. It completely lacks organizational structure. Um, we've got terrible use of contrast. Everything is very blended together. The one graphic that really sticks out is this stupid north arrow. Uh, because it's a big, solid graphic feature and it's black on white, so it's really high contrast and drawing our eye. 
Um, I'm not a fan of North Arrows. They're generally, unless you're looking at a very small extent, they're usually not true. Here we've got North pointing all kinds of directions, so leave these off, please. Um, prime real estate is up here, and we've got this incredibly difficult to consume or approach wad of text. Um, it's going from smaller to slightly bigger. Uh, that's also out of alignment. No, um, no centering, no margins, awkward use of white space, no clear sequence to take this information in at. If we adjust things a little bit, these are the exact same elements on the page, except for the north arrow, uh, but we've worked to increase the, uh, the contrast between the main map frame, which is now united with the purpose of the map. So we've got higher contrast, it's in the right real estate, we've got text hierarchy going from biggest, medium, smallest, organized, attention to detail with our alignments, um, a locator map that's been brought into scale, um, and yeah, that's it. So hopefully you can see. Another trick is to sit back and squint at your work and just ask yourself, like if you're looking at this image, what is your eye drawn to? And mine is popping back and forth between this big black um, con uh, country and the title. And that's a good thing. And then we kind of create some flow going around like this. So um, just another little trick. So again, it's important to have a central theme and make sure that there is something on the page that is, you know, that you're actively working to control your, your attention on, or focus your attention on. When you don't do that, it can end up looking like this, and this is a tragic example because it's such a brilliant piece of work. The research that went into this is, is obviously someone's you know, passion and, uh, and true love. Um, unfortunately, everything is so equally and vitally important that the map ends up kind of communicating nothing because it's impossible to approach. We don't have any clear sense of a title. There's no clear sense of an obvious legend. The labels, the colors are all treated so equally that nothing, uh, you don't know where to start. Um, a great word for this that comes from a blog of the same title is cartastrophe. And cartastrophes can apply to things other than maps, obviously. Um, we've all seen PowerPoint slides like this as well, where Everything on this page is so important that I just went and wrote it all down. Um, in fact, I probably copy and pasted it from the web, and I apologize for that. But it was done to just um, uh, you know, show an example of when you try to make everything so important on a page, you end up communicating nothing. Um, you might be trying to read this while I'm talking, or even worse, I might sit here and just read it out loud to you. Neither one are going to be an effective approach. Come up with a, a central theme make it the biggest, boldest, most visual thing on the page, and then less words to support it, for sure. So, while we're talking about color and use of color, let's dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, depending on the source, the human eye can distinguish between 100,000 and 10 million different shades and hues of color. But thou shall not use them all at the same time, please. <laughs> um, you also can't just grow, you know, go picking colors out of a hat and assigning them willy-nilly. Um, there is a lot of biology, psychology, <coughs> physics that goes into choosing the right colors and what colors mean. Um, uh, whole disciplines of color theory, which we aren't going to go into. We're just going to kind of scratch the surface here. Um, so quickly, what do you think of when you see the color red? You know, most people think heat, danger, threat, warning, dry, angry, yellow, maybe calming. Um, it could be a warning, uh, you know, like a yellow light. Blue tends to be read as water, it's safe, um, cool. Green, healthy, safe, grass, go. Orange um, can be kind of a peaceful color, it can be kind of a fallish color. Um, and purple tends to be a kind of a creative color, uh, something like that. You don't have to agree with any of those things, but you do need to realize that there are emotions associated with colors and um, just don't ignore it. Um, whether you agree with these, know that um, these are being employed against you <laughs> and that they can also work for you. So about the color wheel, a couple things I want you to be aware of are um, the definition of analogous colors, and these are colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. They tend to support each other and work well together. Um, uh, complementary colors with an E are colors that sit opposite each other on the color wheel. 
but my warning about complementary colors is they don't often complement each other. Uh, they tend to really fight against each other visually, and you have to be careful about that. Um, so use complementary wisely and knowingly, and um, use analogous when you're trying to group things together or create harmony on the page. Um, the other term that I want you to be aware of is value. So hue is the type of color that it is. It's the pure color. You can tint hues um, by adding white and making them lighter, and you can shade hues by adding black and making them darker. But value is the umbrella term for how light or dark a color is. So you have hues and then you have differences in value. And that's going to come, in, uh, come into play when we're trying to increase contrast. Um, so going back to complementary colors, colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel, when they're put uh, juxtaposed like this, they tend to create a lot of vibration and they're very hard to look at. Um, you also have to be aware of um, color blindness and ADA compliance in general to make sure things are legible. Also, if you um, convert these to grayscale, uh, I suspect because the values are so similar that, that you would just read these as a solid block of gray. I don't know that the type would be legible at all. We're going to talk about that in a second. Here there's no value contrast. So here the colors are more aligned, they're more analogous, um, but they're the same here. There isn't any kind of um, contrast in the value, so they're the, the same amount of light or dark. On the third row, we have unified colors, but a lot of contrast in the values. So very light against dark, dark against light, dark against light. And that tends to read much, much more easily. The other thing to consider when we're talking about color is that it needs to be data driven when we're applying a color ramp or a gradient. So qualitative color ramps or categorical color ramps are ones that you would use for unorderable categories, things like name, um, land cover types, things that are purely qualitative and non-numeric. Um, you might plot up all the country, or sorry, all the counties in the country by name. So none are better than the other, no rank. A sequential color ramp, these are often called monochromatic and multichromatic, just meaning that they're going from light to dark of the same color or shifting from you know, yellow or orange to purple. But notice that all six of these are going from very light to very dark. That really helps reading, especially when we move to grayscale. These should be used for numbers that increase, decrease, um, or categories that are rankable, like high, medium, low. Um, this is a map of the raw number of alien sightings over the last 100 years per county. And so as we have a numeric count that increases, we have a, you know, uh, I, I guess a multi-chromatic color ramp that goes from black to alien green. And then the last one is called diverging, where you have um, a neutral middle color that diverges um, in two different directions to two different colors. Um, this is classic for political maps, um, anything that has, a, a, I should say, a set of numbers that has a meaningful midpoint or a zero, like um, temperatures above and below freezing. This would be the freezing point. Another application of that is a proportion map um, this has a bunch of tie states, but what we're mapping here are um, the proportion of Bigfoot sightings relative to alien sightings over the last 100 years. So we do have a meaningful midpoint, and then we trend away going to two different colors. All right, and so um, the idea of moving to grayscale is um, illustrated here well. This is your classic color ramp that goes from either hot to cold or dry to wet, and this is rainfall for the Big Island of Hawaii. If we convert this color ramp to grayscale, basically desaturate it, um, I just want you to notice that we have very dark um, shades. No, it's not a shade. I guess um, the hue itself is, it reads as darker. And this is um, a concept called luminance, where these colors might be the, the true or pure hue, but it just reads as lighter on the page. And so if we strip that away, we lose the context of low to high or dry to wet because um, our two extremes read the same way in their um, desaturated shade. Um, the previous set of slides for the qualitative, sequential, and diverging, this is kind of how they map out. And you can see that the most effective way to maintain some kind of meaning in your color when you desaturate is to make sure that your shades are very extreme and high contrast. Okay, so last but not least, getting into the idea of decluttering. 
Um, you can kind of see what I mean here, but my list of suggestions includes limiting the number of colors that you use to help focus the eye on you know, the thing that might be the most important. Um, use desaturated colors to simplify background information. So if I just desaturate this figure a little bit, but leave the figure that I want you to focus on, or the feature that I want you to focus on as its original color, that helps uh, focus the eye a little bit more. Uh, eliminate borders and grid lines when possible. It's not always useful to do that, but sometimes it's not necessary. And um, work on limiting the distance that your eye has to travel to connect labels, legends, scales to the features that they're referring to. So here we removed the axes, or I should say the y-axis, and um, just labeled the bars directly to just make that connection more intuitive. And if it's possible, just get rid of legends altogether. If you can get away with with labels, and that's going to be more effective. And then just bringing it all home here. Uh, this is meant to be an illustration of unemployment rates for some European countries from 2012. Um, it's done in cartogram style, so the countries are scaled to the relative sizes of their unemployment rates. There's a couple of problems with this. Number one, the human eye doesn't readily make sense out of areas as well as it can of comparing lengths of of lines or bars. So the area comparison is already a little bit obfuscated, but then it really expects us to have a clear relationship between the original sizes of these countries. So in order to make sense of these unemployment numbers, we need to have some idea or intuition about what the relative size differences are between Portugal and Greece to start with. And I don't know about you, but I can't even see it right now. And so I really didn't even look at this graphic when I first saw it because I thought, oh, that's just a terrible idea. But my eye, you know, I took a couple seconds and kind of looked at the numbers and in my head I was trying to memorize them and kind of make them sequential and try and make sense of them and then I just gave up. But I thought, let's, let's plot that up in a bar graph and just see if it's any more effective. So European unemployment rates, I updated it to 2017. We still have um, an axis that labels the unemployment rates. I was able to add in an average. Um, and then just for the ones that are farthest away from my labels, I went ahead and labeled them right on the bar. I used two different shades. Um, so I've got higher contrast for the countries that are um, exhibiting the highest unemployment rates. And then just sort of um, crunched down and tried to reduce the contrast. This isn't pretty by any means, I get that. Um, and it could be done a lot more professionally, but hopefully, hopefully you see the idea. We don't lose the spatial context. We could certainly label the countries, um, you know, and add that information back in, um, but using the coordination between the black and the gray, um, and then countries that weren't reporting at all, um, just meant. So I think the point here is that the idea wasn't to simplify here. The idea was to clarify, and this kind of goes back to the very first point of focus and clarity. You need to have a reason for making a graphic and then don't dumb it down or simplify it but work to clarify the message and in this case it made the figure more complex um, but I think does tell the story a little bit uh, in a more straightforward way. So just a bullet list of helpful hints. Work on focusing your message. Use high contrast for the more important features. Realize that the brain can compare lengths much more effectively than areas. Uh, work on clarifying, not simplifying, balance your layout, use hierarchy, declutter the page as much as possible. Um, and that's it. Ultimately, we are there to create meaning. And so going back to what is the job of a good graphic, arguably they should inform, they should communicate, persuade, help manipulate data, explore data, and illuminate patterns that aren't readily visible in the raw text or numbers. Um, ultimately, they should probably be repeatable and transparent. One thing they should definitely be is true. Don't lie. Don't make big mistakes like welcoming, welcoming people to Mexico when it's actually South America. How embarrassing. Here are some great resources for you. Um, Emily and I have been reading about Alberto Cairo's book. Sorry about trashing that. Uh, they are so fabulous. They are like delicious summer beach reading for incredible uh, powerful graphics, super informational and really inspirational and really smart. Um, David McCandless' stuff is just pure joy. Uh, Stephen, Stephen Few has, I've just read th through Now You See It and it again is just 
it just tickles me. It's so well done. Um, and Nathan Yao as well visualized this. These are great resources, great reading. As far as color resources go, um, everyone's heard of Color Brewer. Here's the website. Um, it's a great resource, um, gives great um, ideas for uh, color ramps, um, especially dealing with color blindness. It helps out. Same with um, the ADA compliance website. This is a good thing to check out. Um, custom color ramps are really easy to build an arc map. I suggest that you do it. Um, there are a lot of reasons to use lots of other color ramps other than the ones that they provide. Um, and then if you haven't played with color Adobe or Adobe's Color Picker or Palatin, these you could just waste a whole hour spinning these dials and watching the colors change. Um, it's a great way. And then they just go ahead and give you the hex numbers or the RGB numbers so that you can you know plug those right into Arc if you need to, um, or whatever other software you're using. So that's it. Data visualization in a whirlwind. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. And that's it. Thank you.